Hello and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Coming up, we get the news and top-selling games from September 1987. We go all 3D and examine isometric games. I review some older games. I look at a new title. Jeff returns with more Jet Set Willy mods. And I end with a catch-up on magazines. But first, the news. It seems more and more software houses are looking at movies and television for inspiration and a cheap license to print money. Virgin's next release will be aptly named How To Be A Complete Bastard and follow the antics of Aid Edmondson as he gate crashes a yuppie party. Based on the book of the same name, you control Aid as he wreaks havoc amongst the guests. All in the name of entertainment though, of course. Tynesoft, the rapidly expanding software house, has purchased one of the industry's long-standing companies, Quicksilver. Quicksilver have been in liquidation, and this buyout should see many of their early titles being re-released as budget games. It has not yet been decided which of Tynesoft labels will be used for this, but they have plenty to choose from, including Sparklers, Alternative and Top 10. Talking of old software houses, and Melbourne House was thought to be dead and buried, after last February's takeover by Mastertronic but now the budget publisher claims it will be using the label to sell full-price games again. Mastertronic have been busy lately, buying the rights to many back catalogues, including Ricochet and Ultimate Play the Game, and it hopes to release 199 versions of these companies' games. Palace Software's hit game Barbarian has been banned in Germany because of its realism. The game includes sword fighting and decapitation, and it is said that this kind of imagery would affect German youth and incite violence. And that was the news. And now on to the top selling games. New into the charts this month are Shadow of Mordor, more talking goodness from Melbourne House, Leaderboard Tournament, Golf at its best from US Gold, F15 Strike Eagle, the flight simulator from Microprose, Eyeball from Firebird. and Stormbringer from Mastertronic. And that was the news and top selling games from September 1987. Isometric is a term for Spectrum fans at least, most associated with Ultimate Play the Game's groundbreaking night lore. However, isometric is not the correct terminology, it's dimetric. But I won't go into details about all that technical stuff, and for this feature we'll still keep calling it isometric. This form of visual style in video games was first seen in the arcade classic Zagzon, released in 1982. This Sega classic featured some impressive graphics, as you fly your ship over a 3D landscape. Following quickly behind this came Qbert, a different game altogether, but using the same graphic style. The pyramid is drawn to give the illusion of solid blocks, and Qbert bounces around, changing the colours. Coming along soon after came Congo Bongo. Although this game ran on the same hardware as Zagzon, it made better use of the colour palettes and graphic capabilities, and provided the player with a unique platformer. Home computers, although not as powerful as the arcade machines, were now racing each other to see who could produce this style first. Ant Attack on the Spectrum, written by Sandy White and released in 1983 by Quicksilver, did an excellent job. Even improving on the arcade machines by providing four directional scrolling and four different viewpoints. All or Nothing from Abex made a poor attempt with terrible graphics and jerky gameplay. And Blue Max tried to provide a Zagzon like game but didn't quite pull it off. 
1984, a game arrived that completely changed the market. Night Law from Ultimate Play the Game. No one had ever seen anything like this. Smooth, high resolution graphics, large sprites, complex environments, large game maps, puzzles, collectibles, movable blocks, things you could pick up and take into another room and drop and use to jump on. This really was groundbreaking. The screen was drawn from back to front, allowing blocks closer to the player's viewpoint to be drawn in front of those behind, giving the 3D effect. The floodgates were now open, and other companies were thrown into the battle. Games began to arrive thick and fast, and not all of them good. Pedro from Imagine, for example, looked like a poor typing game. Quicksilver released the follow-up to Ant Attack called Zombie Zombie, using the same game engine, but with more colours. Ultimate released Alien 8, often criticised for being night law with different graphics. Chimera from Firebird came along. Fairlight from The Edge was a game that actually added to the format and gave players more of an adventure style game. Highway Encounter from Vortex gave us a slower Zagson style shooter and puzzle game. And the list goes on and on. Typically, the games were fixed screen maze affairs. As you visited each room, it would be redrawn from scratch. This, however, changed, and companies, ultimate play the game included, began to evolve the technology into multi directional scrolling, as seen in such games as Gunfight. Games of all varieties kept on coming though. The official Zagzon release, which lacked colour, speed, and in fact gameplay. Snuggets, large graphics don't make up for this below average game. Nosferatu the Vampire, back to the single screen affair for this vampire romp. Pyra Curse, impressive scrolling in this Egyptian themed game. Suivo's World, again back to the flip screen engine. But some games really did make an impact, with special mentions for Batman from Ocean, a very successful and well designed game with some brilliant graphics. The Great Escape, a World War II based escape game with some nice graphics. Where Time Stood Still, a classic survival game with multiplayer selection and a nice interface. And of course Head Over Heels, again adding to the formula by having two playable characters, each with their own abilities. Leviathan, the Zagzon wannabe from English Software, which in my opinion failed because you couldn't actually see the player ship. And of course Gauntlet 3, the familiar game but now in glorious 3D. There were even several 3D game creation programs released, so you could make your own versions. Despite companies trying to add to the tested formula, the gameplay was more or less the same. Some companies tried to use the isometric view in sport games. Some tried the Zagson style shooter, like Hate for example. Others stuck to mazes, but the style was very limiting, 
and slowly the game companies moved on. There are still games produced today that use isometric view on most systems, including the Spectrum. It seems odd that there was a time when this viewing style did not exist in gaming, and I was lucky to have been around in 1984 when Nightlaw was released. It was a great time, a time when new styles and new ideas were being introduced. Even though I can't play isometric games very well, I do appreciate the design and graphic style, and certainly since Nightlaw was released, the Spectrum gaming scene changed overnight. As seen from the previous feature, Nightlaw from Ultimate Play the Game started a trend on the Spectrum that is still used today. Also from that feature, you'll gather I can't play isometric games very well, but bear with me. In this game you play Saberman, seeking a cure to the curse, the curse of being a werewolf. You head for Nightlaw Castle, and upon finding the wizard, you discover you have to collect items to be placed in a cauldron to make the cure and you have to do all this in 40 days. Saberman can walk, jump and rotate, as well as push objects and collect them. You have to master these controls to have any hope of making progress past the first few rooms. One special move that is key to this game is the jump collect trick. This allows the player to jump over things they normally can't jump over, or reach ledges usually unreachable. The trick is to drop an item, jump on top of it, arrange your inventory to leave an empty space, and press jump and collect simultaneously. This will cause the character to jump and collect the item at the same time. You can hold three items in your inventory at any given time, and these are collected and dropped in rotation. You start the game in one of several locations, and using a map, or memory if you are good enough, you will know where the cauldron is. Entering this room and watching the bubbles in the cauldron will indicate which item to add next, and off you go. You need to collect 14 items to complete the game, and this is a tough challenge. Many rooms are difficult to navigate, and it takes a lot of practice to get them right. Many rooms are puzzles in themselves as well, with movable blocks, collapsing blocks and chasing enemies. Some rooms require objects, such as tables, to be moved into the right place. Luckily, if you get it all wrong, you can exit and re-enter the room, and it will reset the layout. The game is also played on a night and day cycle, this being displayed at the bottom right. During the day, you are Saberman, changing into a werewolf at night. This change, although well animated, means you cannot move, leaving you open to collisions from enemies. There are differences in the characters too. The wolf can jump slightly further, and some elements in rooms will attack the player when in this form. This adds a bit more strategy, and you have to know the game map to make sure this doesn't happen. The graphics are brilliant, well drawn, and depict each room superbly. Sprites are well defined and move smoothly, sometimes slowing down if there's a lot on screen though. Sound is also well used throughout the game, and control is responsive. As mentioned before, gameplay is tough, even when you master the controls, but this genre-defining title must be tried at least once, or maybe a few times. If, like me, however, you can't get the knack of the controls, you can always watch the game being completed on one of the several YouTube playthroughs. This is the title that defined isometric games on the spectrum, and set the bar so high that it was quite a long time before anything came along to challenge it. A true spectrum classic. From the very best to, well, let's see, shall we? This is Kung Fu Knights, released by Top 10 Software in 1988. I think the title tells you this isn't going to be brilliant, but let's take a look. You play Sir Right a lot, a knight with a wish to retire after 20 years of service. However, the government are not happy about this and send karate trained assassins to stop you. Yeah, this just keeps getting better. The knight, dubbed Full Metal Spastic, yes that's right, it's right there on the inlay, 
also has a Colt 45. Can this get any better? Let's have a go then. This is a side-scrolling beat-em-up, or a shoot-em-up, I'm not really sure, and I think the game also confuses itself. Our character walks from left to right, with smooth-scrolling scenery behind him, and you have to avoid arrows and those karate assassins. You could of course use your Colt 45, except you don't seem to have one despite it being mentioned on the inlay. You can though throw arrows. Those arrows that are thrown at you are a real pain, and you'll quickly find yourself dead. And this is almost as infuriating as that other kung fu game that nobody likes. Oh well, I shall give it another try. As you can see, the arrows leave no room to dodge them. And well, yes, it's game over again, and back to that awful music. Right, it's time for an infinite lives poke. I did try this game many, many times, probably about 20, all ending after about ooh, 60 seconds. Really infuriating. I wanted to see more of the game to see if it actually got any better. And I don't think I'm going to spoil anything by saying it doesn't. It's just the same gameplay over and over again. There's no Colt 45, but you do occasionally get the odd dog to shoot. In this game you can't move and fire at the same time, so you actually have to stop to throw the arrow. You can actually hit the bad guys by thumping them, but why bother? You can also jump, and this is used to avoid the very rare arrow that moves horizontally. There's a timer at the bottom left, and you have to reach the end of the level before it runs out. But each level is pretty much the same, with just different bland backgrounds. The graphics are nice, well drawn and smooth, and sound is average I suppose, but the gameplay is terrible. On and on you march, throwing arrows and getting hit by impossible to dodge enemy arrows. Yeah, this is a bad game, particularly when you consider it was released in 1988. Stay well clear of this one. This is Sewer Rage, written by Death Squad in 2016. The job centre has forced you into mandatory work, so your benefits are not stopped. Unluckily, the job is to repair the sewers. Once past the excellent music on the opening screen, the game throws you straight into work. You have to manoeuvre all the pipe segments to the top of the screen to complete the repair. Things are not all that easy though, as there are enemies to avoid. To move a piece of pipe you have to get below it and then punch it upwards. The enemies chase you continually, so you have to lead them away from the pipe pieces and then rush back to try and complete the level. As each level finishes, the next one comes along with different pipe layouts and more enemies. The graphics are fantastic and very colourful, but to maintain that look they do move in jumps though, but this doesn't deter from the gameplay at all. Sound is used well with effects for hitting the blocks, running into enemies and adding a piece of pipe. The gameplay gradually gets harder, but you can only lose energy by actually running into the enemies. If you stay still, they just surround you, but don't attack. You can also punch them to the top of the screen if you feel like it, and this kills them and they respawn lower down. Randomly food appears, and when collected it replenishes your energy. So keeping an eye out for this will keep your energy levels up. This is a great game, easy to play, easy to get into, and definitely worth tracking down.
There are 101 Jet Set Willy mods on the world of Spectrum. I've played them all, and these are some of my favourites. Today we're going to take a look at Jet Set Willy, The Man Who Sold the World. Willy, The Man Who Sold the World was released in 2008 by The Drunken Master. Now, The Drunken Master is actually a reference to an old Jackie Chan film. I didn't realise that until I started doing a bit of research for this series. Now, the first thing I'm going to say about this and the next game is I deliberately saved the best two games in this list until last. And in doing that, I've actually saved the best two authors till last. So one of the things that I've said before is I only chose one game from any one author. Now when I came through and started rating the games to go into this list, I would quite often come up against games that I thought, why haven't I included this so far? And then realised, ah, I've already included a game from this author. And then I would have the really difficult decision of whether to include the game I was just playing or the game that I decided on before. Yet again, this is a 1 to 8k version of Jet Set Willy. So has that better music, has that better sound that I've said a lot of the other games have? The backstory to this game is really good. You don't play Willy. Or you do play Willy, but not the original Jet Set Willy. You play his son, also called Willy. And it comes at the end of the original Jet Set Willy's life. He's on his deathbed. And he says to his son, I have one thing I want you to do for me. Years ago, I sold the world. And Willy says, I want you to get it back for me. I sold it to a strange man. And he says, the only way you can get it back is to collect some really rare artefacts. There's your excuse for having your Willy go around and collect up a load of objects that are difficult to get because these are the artefacts that you need to buy back the world. Interesting thing about this game is it says early on in the blurb about the game that Maria isn't your final guardian, that this man who wants the artefacts is. But you can still get into the bedroom and see Maria guarding the bed, only this time she's guarding the bed and there is somebody lying in it. The original Jet Set Willy is lying in it, so you can't get to him until you get all the artefacts. Now the very first thing that struck me about this game is how beautiful the new bathroom looks. It's titled Rustic Bathroom of the Future, but it looks really, really good. The next thing that strikes you is, as you go into the next room where the hall used to be, there's a kind of rogues gallery of all the different Jet Set Willy characters that have been used in some of these modern games over the years. And looking at that, you certainly recognise a lot of the characters that you play and I have played as I've looked through Jet Set Willy mods, and I thought that was a really, really nice touch. And then even in the next screen, there is a few more pictures of other characters. If you read the blurb that comes with the game, you find out that the reason there's this second room with more pictures is the author just couldn't fit in all the original pictures into the game. When you start playing the game, you actually find it's quite linear. It does have quite a linear feel to it. There are some tricky sections, but it's not too difficult. I'm not going to go too much into the game and how you play it, because I would really encourage people to go and seek this game out themselves. And if you do, there are a number of kind of hidden tricks and things that you need to do to kind of get into the game and get the game going. In fact, the first time I played this game, I didn't like it. I thought, this is stupid. I don't seem to be able to make much progress. I can't figure out what I'm doing here. But as anyone who listens to my YouTube channel will know, I really love a puzzle and really love a puzzle game. And it became kind of a puzzle game for me and puzzling out what the route was. And I thought that was a really good touch. One thing it makes use of is the thing that happens in Jet Set Willy 2 where when you collect the objects in a room things begin to move. There's also a brilliant effect quite early on in the game which I really liked and thought was a really nice touch when I saw it in that what you think is one sprite is actually two sprites and they're kind of intermeshed. As Willy Jr. takes his trip to get these artifacts he kind of visits various places throughout the world. So there's New 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 York and Neo Tokyo, and some strange place that isn't quite sure where it is with some strange temple. And that's where the man who owns the world, who wants the artifacts, is. And you have to collect a load of artifacts and take them there. As I said, this game isn't too hard. There are some tricky bits in it. And I had a conversation on the World of Spectrum forums with the author of this game. I told him I really like it. And one of the things he said is, he is prone to making his games a bit hard and prone to using one trick in particular 
which is that if the willy sprite hits a certain kind of block just at the right angle in the right point, he kind of sinks into it. Now that's used once that I know of in this game, though certainly once I had to use it. I've completed this game using save states. I might one day try and complete it without, so actually really try to master this game and complete it without save states, and that's probably the highest compliment I could give it. So that's Jet Set Willy, the man who stole the world. It is really well worth seeking out. I'd encourage everyone to seek this out who's listening to this. Give it a go. Persist with it. Because as I say, it's a bit of a puzzle at the start, but once you figure out what you're doing, it is a really, really good game. And the end is definitely worth seeing. So until next time, happy gaming! This is Spectres by Bugbyte Software, released in 1982. You play Eddie the Electrician in his never-ending task to rewire a large mansion. Unluckily for Eddie, the mansion is haunted with four ghosts. So then, it's a maze game with four ghosts. Sound familiar? Well, it's a kind of Pac-Man clone, although in this game, you don't eat any dots, you fit light bulbs. It's a reverse Pac-Man if you like, the aim being to lay all the bulbs without getting killed. Like Pac-Man, there are power pills, but in this game, they're generators that turn on all the light bulbs that you've fitted. This makes the ghosts near the bulbs less powerful, and they can be destroyed if you bump into them. The downside though is all of the bulbs that are lit up by the generators vanish, and you have to start all over again, which is a bit mean really. You can make the generators run longer by collecting cans of fuel that randomly appear during play, which gives you two strategies. The first is to fit as many light bulbs as possible, collect as many cans as possible, and then start the generators. Once started, you have to then try and complete the remaining bulbs before the generators stop. The second strategy is to turn on the generators first, wait for them to finish, and then start placing all the bulbs. And this one seems to be more successful for me. and once all the bulbs are fitted, you have to get back to the central room to move to the next level. And here the maze changes and you start again. The graphics as you can see are smooth, but do flicker sometimes. But they're simple to control, making the game easy to play. Sound is used well with some good effects, and the gameplay is very tricky. Unlike many Pac-Man clones, the ghosts in this one do act differently. The red one, for example, will chase you directly, while the yellow one will try and stay away. Overall, and not a bad game for 16k, it's certainly a challenge, and a nice change from the usual Pac-Man clones. If you watched episode 40 of the show, you will know that I covered computer magazines in great depth, and it nearly drove me crazy. But I did miss out several magazines. One which was known to me was Micro Adventurer, and the other two I was not aware of, Micro Update, which I can't find anywhere in the entire world, and Games Computing, several issues of which I recently grabbed from eBay. Because I have a few issues of this, I'll be taking a look through them as a kind of episode 40 update. Games Computing started life in January 1984, and was published by Argus Press. As the title suggests, it was mainly aimed at games players, usually of home computers, but it did spread out into other systems. The covers were bright and well presented, and inside we get the usual content. There's news from around the industry, usually focusing on games, a letters page in the form of a section named The Runaway Robot, hardware reviews, system reviews, unusually a wargaming section, game reviews and typing games. The best typing games get their very own two-page poster in the centre of the issue, and again the artwork is very good. In fact, most of the typing games 
are provided with some really nice artwork. The game reviews seem to be limited to around 500 words and they're very to the point. They have to be really when they're limited to such small amounts of space. They include the box cover art but very rarely the screenshot. I think in all of the issues that I've got there's only two screenshots in the reviews. Some of the features are interesting too, like the one about computer animation from the February 85 issue. This magazine had a short life, the last issue being sold in March 1985. That means there was only 14 issues. No wonder I've never seen it before, either in the newsagent at the time or on the internet now. It's an interesting read, looking back at the game's reviews and features. And it also turned up some typing games that are not found anywhere. So maybe I'll get down to some typing and see what they're like.